Can you hear? Sorry. Prof. Bang, shall we begin? That, mm, Prof. Pang. Morning, Prof. Pang. Prof. Pang, we are speaking now, but I think probably I need to put it in the chat. Testing, Satyuradika.
Good morning, everyone. For those who are joining us online, so we have some technical glitch that we are not able, uh, we are looking into it. So please be patient. We'll resume soon. Thank you. Good morning, Prof. Pang. We, can you hear us? Maybe we can use a chat box. You can hear us. Good, good, very good. And we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Fantastic, Prof. Yeah, you can hear us now, right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I think uh, we have some. Uh, but we don't get to see you. We are yeah, 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 yeah. I think Great. we are doing. Okay, okay sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, technical problem. Okay, I think we can we can uh, get the program start and uh, sorry for the delay. Yes, Prof. Pang, I think we can uh, start the, uh, the webinar. Probably, like, you know, I can start to uh, welcome all the audience today. Sorry for the delay in the, uh, in the start of the webinar, but now I presume like, you know, everything is okay to, to start to like, you know, go into the webinar today on the neurology and oncology. The title or the theme, basically, our experts are going to share their experience on the proton and radiation therapy for neurology and oncology. We have uh, moderators from Changgung Memorial Hospital, Prof. Pang, always joining us. And also we have uh, another moderator today joining from the other side as well, Professor Wang. Right? With that, from... Hi, Prof. So with that, um, I'm Selvi from uh, International Office Faculty of Medicine. Today we'll be moderating from this side. And also we have speakers from both sides to share their experience. I would like to uh, pass it on to Prof. Pang to begin the section. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us again. And sorry for the uh, technical uh, delay, technical problem. Uh, I think we will uh, start right away. Uh, today, we are happy to have uh, experts from both sides to talk about neurology and oncology, especially focused on uh, radiotherapy. So I think I will uh, let my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Wang, to introduce our speaker, Professor Chen. Uh, and both of them are our experts and they are, have a um, lot of experience in proton therapy. So, uh, Professor Wang, please. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, it's our pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Chen. Yeah. You know, the Professor Zhang is already as our uh, radiation oncology faculty for more than 25 years. And uh, uh, his specialty is focusing on the uh, pediatric uh, patients. So uh, I think the uh, most uh, significant benefit of proton therapy, uh, especially for the brain tumor, is for the uh, uh, 
children uh, patients. Yeah, and we know the uh, children patients is uh, is around our uh, seven percent of our uh, proton therapy patients is uh, uh, children. So today is our we are very glad to have uh, Dr. Jen to share uh, his experience on the proton therapy for children. So welcome, Dr. Jen. Can you see the slide? So starting to share screen. Can you see it? Not yet, but I think it's, it's probably going to take a bit of time. Okay. Yes, that's right, Prof. We can see it. Okay, good. Okay, good morning. Uh, now I'm going to present the, uh, the proton therapy in, uh, used in the pediatric brain, brain tumors. Uh, Prof Seng, um, sorry. Prof Seng, we can't see your full slides. Uh, would you like to put it on a full, full screen? Would you like to put it on a full screen maybe, Prof? Yes, this is perfect. This is Thank perfect. you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Now, what you see now is the our our our, our prone center uh, in in Linko Changge Memorial Hospital, and yes. And you can see the the major difference between the X ray and the proton is the. Proton have the advantage of the black peak. Come on, man. Can you see the new slide? We are moving the new slide for We can't see the, the next slide, still on the first slide, Prof. Yeah. How about now? This is okay now. Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And you can see the major difference between the proton and X-ray, uh, because the proton have the advantage of the black P. And after the black P, uh, the the radiation exposure is almost zero after the black P. But not like the X-ray. X-ray when you enter the body, uh, it will reach the highest. Uh, those in uh, just beneath the, the surface, and then it will trap, it will deposit his his, his uh, energy uh, gradually through the body. So that's the uh, in vivo evidence that 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 can, that can convince us that the proton beam really can stop in the uh, in in the in the body. Uh, when you see the panel A, that's the uh, uh, spine vertebra. MRI image uh, before treatment. You can see the uh, very homogeneous mirror uh, before the treatment. And in the panel B, uh, you can see the, the dose distribution of the proton uh, dose. And in the panel C, you can see the metal change uh, because the, the after the radiation uh, exposure, the, bone, the red metal will become the uh, yellow metal and, and have a different uh, presentation in the MRI image. 
So you can see the uh, panel ABC is from the literature. It's the, the uh, evidence of the proton beam can start uh, in the body by the, the, the olfaction uh, pass, uh, with so-called passive sex gathering proton beam. And in our the, the right panel is our uh, patient's data that we can also see uh, even in the, the so-called intensity moderated proton therapy, the MPT, we can also observe the very similar uh, male change, even in the dose less than 10% uh, of the threat dose. So therefore, with the, the proton B, you can avoid the, the radiation exposure after uh, the radiation hit the target. We can see in the uh, left panel, the red, red dash one is the area that if you use the proton beam, we can avoid this area from the, the, the exposure uh, when you choose proton instead, instead of the, the X-ray. Now this is the uh, example of the dose profile comparison between the uh, photon that uh, use the MRT technique and the proton plan uh, use the uh, passive scattering uh, in the right upper and the IMPD in the lower panels. So you can see with the, with the uh, X-ray, uh, the IMRT, you can see uh, in the whole ventricle technique, uh, you can see the uh, IMRT will produce more uh, radiant dose in the temporal lobe. Uh, both in the right temporal lobe and uh, in the in the in the left temporal lobe, and the overall exposure dose in the brain is also higher in the X-ray, and you can see the the three proton technique, the best scattering or the uh, MPD with small bean size and and large bean size produce similar uh, normal tissue sparing effect. Uh, in the temporal lobe and in the overall brain area. Uh, what's the effect of the uh, higher radiant exposure to the uh, brain function? In a recent publication from uh, Toronto, uh, they observed that if the patient uh, have higher median dose, you can see in the, the first, the, the panel A, in a, in a panel A, if you have a higher temporal low mean dose, uh, you will have uh, more impact in the global IQ. So as the patient is younger, the, the effect will be more significant. So lower the dose to the temporal low, but you, you, you can preserve more uh, global IQ. And if you have uh, more dose to the supratentorial brain, or uh, you will more dose to the supratentorial brain, you will have uh, uh, more damage to the process speed and the uh, working memory. So as long as you have uh, less radiant dose in the normal brain, you will preserve more brain function as the, you can, you can see from uh, the, data in the photon brain. This is not from the proton, it's uh, uh, from the uh, photon brain, either, either with CD, CRT, or MRT, or, or VMAT. So when we use the proton therapy, uh, most of the time we, we can decrease the, the dose because of the black peak effect. We can decrease dose to the adjacent normal tissue and then we can reduce the uh, long-term side effect, just we have uh, observed in the previous patients. But sometimes, because the proton uh, can safely uh, to, uh, to avoid the, the most significant toxic effect, so sometimes if it's safe, we will increase the dose to the tumor to increase the tumor control effect, just like we have observed in the, uh, in the treatment for uh, codoma or chondrosarcoma in the scar base. So what's the negative effect of radiation therapy in the uh, pediatric brain? Uh, most of the time we talk about the cognitive impairment and sometimes we can observe the hormone deficiency and sometimes we can observe the neuroplasty with the hidden or visual dysfunction. And sometimes we can 
uh, observe the vascular palsy in the scar base uh, vascular damage. And uh, in the long run, we, we can observe the, the some racial patient will have the will have developed the second malignancy. And this is the journal of uh, uh, published last year uh, from the uh, United States. Uh, they observed uh, two populations uh, joined the same uh, clinical oncology group uh, guideline uh, protocol to, to treat the uh, pediatric medial blastoma. Uh, the two group, one group uh, used the photon uh, treatment uh, in the uh, gross spinal religion and, and tumor by boost, and the other one uh, used the proton uh, with the same dose range and the same uh, chemotherapy regimen. But in the long run, uh, they, they, they found a change uh, in the global IQ and the perceptual reasoning and the working memory uh, has different between these two kinds of the, uh, the gene technique group. So you can see from their result, uh, the panel A is the global IQ, the Green one is the proton therapy treated children, and the red one is the photon X ray treated patient. The, the photon treated patient have a greater decrease in the global IQ after uh, the, the longer follow up. And you can see similar uh, result in the perceptual reasoning in the uh, proton and the photon one. Uh, proton one can preserve most of uh, the, the perceptual reasoning ability but the photon, the X-ray one, will also see the gradual decrease. And also in the uh, working memory, you can see very similar pattern of preserving the uh, working memory in proton PDH patient and uh, a gradual loss in the photon X-ray one. So we can see the, the proton treated uh, PDH patients uh, even in uh, material blastoma patients, they, they receive like, a whole brain, whole spine, and the tumor bed boost. They can uh, preserve a lot of the patient from the damage of the global IQ and, and, and working memory and, and also the perceptual reasoning. But how about the, the, the treatment, uh, tumor control? In a retrospective study, they, they, compare, they compare the, the uh, survival outcome in the standard risk material blastoma patient are treated with proton or photon, and they can uh, they cannot see the difference between the uh, overall survival difference. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can see in the photon and proton one, they have very similar six year survival at about 80%. So they have a very similar uh, tumor control in the long run. So how about the ependymoma? Because, uh, because ependymoma and, uh, and the metriomata is the uh, most frequent encountered uh, tumor that we, we treat in the pediatric uh, patients. So you can see the survival outcome is uh, no difference uh, in a uh, proton and photon. And how about the, the, the outcome in epidemoma? Uh, you can, this is a, a, this is a paper published by uh, MGH uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Boston. And they, they can see the overall uh, program free survival at six years is around uh, 80% uh, in, in the gross total removal of patient and about 40% in the subtotal or near total removal of patients. Uh, this result is very similar to the, uh, the, the recent uh, uh, AC, uh, COG trial, ACNS0121. You can see the uh, gross total removal have the uh, about 70% uh, five year survival and about 40% in the near total or uh, subtotal removal tumor. So the, the tumor control is uh, very similar, also very similar uh, between the photon and, and proton treatment in the ependymoma. But uh, when we treat the ependymoma, sometimes we will, uh, if, you, you, if you treat the, them with the photon, uh, they will have a higher dose to the pituitary. So uh, if you have a higher uh, radiant dose to the pituitary area, uh, you can see in the right panel, the accumulate dose, uh, if the, it's at around uh, less than 20 grade, you can see uh, less effect in the hormone deficiency. Uh, as the, the, the exposure dose uh, getting Higher and higher, you can see more and more a patient suffer from the uh, hormone deficiency after longer follow up. And how about the radiation associated second, secondary brain tumor? Uh, 
because the, uh, if you use the MRT, you will have a, a more, uh, that, that we call the rain shower in the brain. So they, they will uh, expect that we, they will higher risk of a second malignancy induced by radiation uh, in, uh, if you use the uh, MRT. But uh, proton beam theoretically have less radiation exposure in the brain, so we'll have less uh, radiation induced second malignancy after the long run. So since we know the, the, the proton and photon have a very similar tumor control uh, in the pediatric brain tumor patients, so how about the, the, the real world data uh, uh, in, in, and we can uh, observe? Uh, uh, the, the largest database is from the United States. They have uh, uh, funded a pediatric proton photon consortium registry uh, since 2012. And by now they have appeared more than 2,000 pediatric patients uh, in the in the United States uh, centers to treat the pediatric patients. So you can see uh, the most of patients are treated by uh, in their register is, is the uh, material plastoma, pinea, or pineal plasma, and, and followed by the epidemioma and by the astrocytic glioma patients. So we can see uh, in their register, if the, the tumor is, uh, is the you can see the the one hundred percent one. If the tumor diagnosis is the chondroma or the uh, uh, chondro uh, sarcoma in the base, more uh, all of the patient was treated by the proton therapy. But if the, the when the, the diagnosis is the ependymoma, uh, about half the patient are treated by the proton. And when it comes to the material plasma, about one fifth of the patient treated by the the uh, proton. So uh, depends on the, the availability of the proton facility. Um, you, you can see uh, there are more and more uh, patients treated by the, by the proton in the United States. And in our center, we started the treatment uh, since uh, 2015. And, and by now we have uh, treated uh, about uh, 200 pediatric patients. Uh, among them, uh, 95 patients are uh, CS tumors. You can see also we have treated, uh, the, the most frequent one is the material plasma. We have treated 30 patients uh, of material plasma in our, in our population. And we have uh, followed by the epidemia 20 patients, and then uh, followed by the germ cell tumor. Uh, because germ cell tumor is uh, 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 more frequent happen uh, in the uh, East Asia than in the United States. So in our uh, area, we, we have a uh, treat, the, the, the third most frequent treated uh, patient is the uh, primary CNS uh, cancer tumors. And also we have three, uh, uh, the other, uh, maybe uh, you can see the, the benign tumors, just like the meningioma and craniofangioma and also the codoma uh, in, in our patient population. Here's an example uh, that we treat uh, uh, the, the one patient with choroidal carcinoma. Here's the right prior to uh, carcinoma. This patient has been, uh, a tumor has been removed uh, first and then received the, the chemotherapy. You can see before the chemotherapy, the, tum the tumor base is totally clear. And after, uh, after five years forward, the, the, tumor, the patient is now uh, still disease free. Here's the, the, the dose profile, uh, the, the, uh, the cross spinal treated by the uh, proton therapy in our center. You can see uh, with the, the help of the repeat in proton therapy, you can see uh, there's no, totally no dose exposure in the facial part, in the facial part or the area uh, in front of the particular body. You can see there's no, no dose pass it out to the, the facial part or to the, uh, to the internal organ uh, in front of the their body. And when it comes to the tumor bed ready therapy, when you compare the red therapy uh, photon plan and the proton plan, you can see the proton plan can preserve a lot of the frontal lobe and, uh, and the dry temporal area. Uh, as, as just, as I just mentioned, uh, if you have a low dose to the other normal 
a brain area, you can preserve more uh, IQ or the uh, uh, working memory or, or the percent speed uh, index. So as long as you can preserve by the uh, more advanced technique, you can have better long-term outcome in the neural function. Uh, this is our uh, uh, very uh, short time uh, uh, observation uh, in the uh, patient uh, treated by proton and, and uh, photon. And we observed the, uh, the patient treated by proton beam uh, have a better maintenance of the multi-domain neural function in our patient. And if the patient treated by the photon, we, we have observed a more rapid decre decrease in the neural function in our patient treated by photon. Uh, that, that, we, uh, that we published uh, three years ago in, in the uh, applied neuropsychology. So this is the conclusion of my, my talk today is the prone therapy uh, in uh, pediatric sense tumor patients. Uh, they can have a comparable tumor control outcome, uh, just like the photon treatment, but they can produce less long-term damage in the brain function in these PTH patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, for your uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, I think we will uh, hand over to Thank you so much, Rafang, and uh, thanks so much, Prof. Say, this wonderful therapeutic outcome you show with the proton therapy for your very younger patients, uh, uh, you know, that, that, like, especially on the cognitive ability. Um, do we have questions from our panel uh, experts here? Any questions, Prof? No, all right. If not now, uh, perhaps we can actually continue from UM side. I would like to um, first welcome our first experts, uh, Prof. Hari Chandran, who's our neurosurgeon. Um, professor is also specialized into the neurosurgery on the neuro-oncology, radio surgery, and also complex spine surgery. Prof. Hari also working on the clinical translational aspects and also the central nervous system related uh, expertise. With that, I would like to invite Prof. Hari. Prof Pang and Prof Wang, can you see the slides? Prof? Should we okay? okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start then. Thank you very much. Very good morning, Professors Pang Si Tong, Wong Chen Chia, and Chen Kan Seng. Thank you very much for this collaboration between this CGMH and UM webinars. We look forward for more of this and future collaborations. We're looking into the embracing the uh, particle therapy with the proton beam ourselves. But today I'm here to talk to you all, or rather share our humble experience of stereotactic radiation therapy, SRS and SRT for vestibular schwannomas, okay? The University of Malaya Linac experience. So we, stereotactic radiation therapy, SRS and SRT, we embarked on the fact that this was a modality used to arrest the growth of benign tumors. Okay, to make sure that there is no progression of the tumor. So there are many platforms, the gamma knives, the linear accelerators, uh, the cyber knife. But in 2015, based on the most viable economic model and utility coefficients, we settled for the Novalis TX, which was launched in May of 2015. 
So coming to vestibular schwannomas, a little overview. It's a benign tumor that accounts for about 8 to 10% of all intracranial tumors and 80 to 90% of um, um, CP angle tumors. The tumor growth rate is variable, ranging from 0.35 to 0.9 millimeters a year. There have been observational studies to show that tumors that are more than 2 cm tend to grow a bit faster. And while these tumors have a linear pattern of growth, at some point, and we don't know when and why, they can just lose their linear pattern and become exponential. The management of vestibular schwannomas, that is the expectant management, that is increasingly becoming smaller. And then the treatment operation options are surgery and radiation therapy, hypofractionated stereotactic radiosurgery and stereotactic radiosurgery. While surgery from time immemorial has remained the mainstay and primary modality of treatment, now over the years with the advancements of techniques, uh, IT platforms, imaging modalities, SRS and SRT is slowly becoming comparable and arguably looking to replace a lot of the surgical indications. So what are the treatment goals in SRS and SRT? Tumor control, preserve serviceable hearing, preserve the seventh and fifth nerve functions, improve or at least maintain the neurological status, and lastly, to obviate the possible complications of surgery. What are the challenges we face? The low proliferative index of the tumors, the proximity of these tumors to the eloquent structures, and extension of the tumor into the porous acousticus, the internal auditory canal, and then NF2, type 2 neurofibromatosis, which is bilateral vestibular schwannomas, remains a separate cohort of challenges and indications. So a patient coming to our center for SRS or SRT, the workflow algorithm consists and starts with a detailed physical examination looking into its hearing, the Rennes Weber's test, the examination of the cranial nerves, okay, the cerebellar function is determined, and all of them get a audiometry. So the audiometry, the pure tone audiometry remains the best initial screening test. And in our series of about 75 cases, as I will be presenting shortly, only about 12% had an initial normal PTA. And this is to look for asymmetrical high frequency hearing loss. Speech discrimination loss is often out of proportion to measured hearing loss. Once we have examined these patients, as far as their hearing are concerned, they are stratified into the Gartner-Robson scale of their hearing level, okay, with grade ones and two being considered serviceable hearing. Then the patient undergoes the imaging, so treatment planning is essential for proper imaging. So the MR imaging sequences we do would be Thin slice volumetric amperage uh, image uh, MRI sequences at one millimeter slice thickness, thin slice T2 uh, Fiesta uh, sequences, and then CT imaging. Thin slice CTs of less than 1.5 millimeters thickness with careful evaluation of the bone windows. So, what are the things we consider during? Uh, treatment planning, the critical anatomy that we look into, the internal auditory canal, the cochlea and the vestibule, the facial and trigeminal nerves, and the brainstem. Some of the treatment planning considerations, hearing preservation, the tenet, when you work, when neurosurgeons uh, with skull-based skull expertise, okay, come into the fold of management of vestibular schwannomas, there's always this conundrum of hearing preservation. So hearing preservation becomes the primary tenet, tenet in the management of these cases. So for hearing preservation, we look into the dose intensity, the dose homogeneity, okay. and we prescribe to the 80 to 90%. So this is with the LINAC-based systems. It is homogeneity versus heterogeneity. So it's prescribed to the 80 to 90% minimum to avoid hot spots on the nerve. And the cochlear dose is, dose is a vital consideration. 
So when we come to treatment planning margins, the encapsulate tube must be ensured that the tight margins should be drawn on the appearance from the imaging that we have got and a one millimeter or less uh, additional margin for the PTV is sometimes employed. The critical dose envelope, again, looking into hearing preservation. So the distance between the cochlea and the portion of the tumor in the internal auditory meters is looked into. So ideally, that should be more than two centimeters. Any distance of less than one centimeter, and we are going to be pretty sure that we will not be able to preserve the hearing. We try and keep the dose onto the cochlea to be less than 4.2 uh, grays. So the beam arrangements are determined. Of course, again, other modalities like intensity modulated radiotherapy for cochlear sparing techniques, all in the hope and the aim of preserving hearing. So we improve the local control and minimize toxicity by fractionation. Okay, so again, decrease the toxicity and at the same time, try and maximize the preservation of hearing. So SRS versus SRT, one is for single fractions, multiple fractions uh, for SRT. In our center, we have embarked between five to seven fractions uh, with a dose of about 35 uh, grays. Uh, in uh, fractionated uh, stereotactic uh, radio surgery. Some of the OAR uh, organs at risk, eloquent structures, some of the constraints, constraints or limitations that we work with is to ensure that the brain stem does not get a dose of more than 12.5 grays. And ideally, we keep the cochlea or the modulus dose to less than 5.3 grays. Okay, and quite often in a lot of our treatment plans, we tend to keep it below 4 grays. We ensure that the conformality index and the homogeneity indices are maintained at less than 2. In the linear accelerator systems, the treatment is to the 80% isodose line. So, how do we follow up these patients? If after the treatment, MRIs are done six monthly to look at uh, tumor radiation complications. Now, I must say, over time, we have actually gone away from this. Now, we, after the patient has received treatment, um, they are reviewed after two weeks, six weeks, three months, and then six months and yearly. The first imaging that we actually do if the patient is asymptomatic is after a year. So, the tumor response or effects are seen between six months to five years. So, PET scans, MRI. So, during the early days of our experience, when patients even showed the slightest symptoms of uh, following radio surgery, we used to have a very low threshold to repeat imaging, and that is how we used to pick up these things. So, the SRS data. So if you look at the global SRS data, the first use by Lexal at the Karoliska Institute in 1969 and henceforth. So when you look at those days about the complications that came with stereotactic radiation therapy. So all this involves the evolution of dose. They used to give doses of 14 to 18 grays and they had higher complications. So at such doses, there was good tumor control, but high complication rate and low hearing preservation. Then with the evolution of doses to 11 to 13 grays, you still have good tumor control, lower complication rates, and better hearing preservations. So modern SRS series show progression-free survival for 92 to 100% of the cases and hearing preservation in up to 70% of the cases. So, where we are now, Kuala Lumpur, Greater Kuala Lumpur, often referred to as Klang Valley, we have a population of 7.6 million. There are 11 neurosurgical centers, four major public centers and four private uh, centers. For stereotactic SRS and SRT services, there are four linear accelerators in Klang Valley, actually five, one of them uh, providing services as well, and four gamma knives. So with this number for such a population, 
the cases that we have treated in UM for vestibular schwannomas over the last five years, between May 2015 and May 2020, has been about 75 cases. Some of them were referred as a primary modality of treatment, post-surgery tumor residue, and post-surgery tumor recurrences. We have had 57 cases that underwent stereotactic radiosurgery and 18 cases that underwent fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy. So, analyzing our statistics and our data for SRS for vestibular schwannomas in UM, we had about 56 cases. The mean volume of tumors that was treated was 2.34, ranging between 11 and 0 0.3. You could argue, why did you go and treat a tumor that was 0 0.3? You know, wasn't there a role for expectant management? So, this was a patient that had presented with tinnitus and disequilibrium. And studies have shown that tinnitus and disequilibrium is a predictor of tumor progression. So this patient was treated and uh, actually had a good control of the tumor and the symptoms subsided. Mean dose to the isocenter was 13.58 grays, ranging between 15 to and the minimum dose of 13 grays. A mean marginal dose of 12 grays to the 80% isodose line. For SRT, in, uh, for vestibular schwannomas in UM, we had a total of 18 cases. Mean volume treated was 7.64, the highest volume of 11.2. The mean dose to the isocenter was 29.35 grays, grays, and the mean number of fractions was about 6.56. The vast majority of our cases were treated with 35 grays in, delivered over seven fractions. So the outcome of our humble series, SRS dose of 13 grades, and we had an overall tumor control rate of about 96% at three years. Our hearing preservation at one year, so serviceable hearing, deteriorating to a Gardner-Robson scale of three was about 13%, and serviceable hearing deteriorating to a Gardner-Robson scale of four to non-serviceable uh, Severe hearing impairment was about 7%. Facial and trigeminal dysfunction was less than 1%. We had two patients, one with a fifth nerve where there was a diminished uh, corneal reflex, and one patient had drooling of saliva at the angle of his mouth with a slight rhizoris weakness, but otherwise there were no fifth and seventh nerve uh, deficits. More than one third, about 36% of our cases regressed about two-thirds remain stable. Three cases out of the 75 cases, three cases showed progression of tumor on volumetric analysis. One of those cases significantly ended up requiring surgery. The other two cases on subsequent uh, MR surveillance imaging remain stable, and so management was continued uh, for conservatively. Follow-up. 30% of vestibular schwannomas will show a transient increase in size. Again, this was picked up during our early days when we used to have a low threshold to repeat imaging early. So these tumors tend to show a slight volumetric increase by about two to three millimeters in the first three to six months, and then they gradually regressed. I must say, hearing may continue to decline, but you know, we have um, not really had very proper follow-ups because of patient attrition and interdepartmental uh, issues to actually follow up on um, the hearing uh, assessments of these patients. So I'd just like to illustrate some of the cases that we have had. I was speaking to Professor Linda and we said, look, we will just show the cases that where we will manage to control the tumor and the patients remained asymptomatic. So this is a patient post-surgery with a residual significant residue uh, that was managed with SRS. Okay, so despite the brainstem uh, condition, we were managed to get a tight envelope and 13 grays to the, uh, a 12 gray to the 80% isodose and this patient had control of tumor. So this was the imaging after one year, which showed 
stable disease. This is a patient was also treated with 12 grays to the 80% isodose uh, and post-surgery you could see hypo intensities or necrosis within the tumor. Patient remained asymptomatic and uh, is continuing to be followed up. So this cases we're illustrating some of the cases of radionecrosis. So this was a patient who presented with uh, sensory neural hearing loss and some disequilibrium and uh, we treated with SRS 12 grays to the 80 percent isodose. Patient remained well asymptomatic on all follow-ups but when we did the imaging after one year it showed this picture but Again, patient was remaining asymptomatic, so we continued with continued MR surveillance and imaging. And patient is doing well. So some of our cases, three years post-SRS, small residues, tumors control, no progression of diseases, and so on. <clears throat> so. I will just run through this. This is just more illustration. So just introducing our radio surgery team. So in UM, the SRS team for neurosurgery consists of myself and my colleague, Dr. Amrit Pal Singh, who is also a neurosurgeon with interest in vascular neurosurgery. The UM SRS oncology team consists of Prof. Adlinda, Prof. Anita, and Prof. Ho. Our main <coughs> uh, referral patterns come from the UM uh, neurosurgery skull based team consisting of Professor Vigneswaran, Mr. Ravindran, Professor Prabhakaran, and Dr. Revadi. They are the auto neurologists. Now, we embark on the tenet that stereotactic radiation therapy should not be expounded as an easy way out for a bad skull based surgeon or a bad neurological surgeon. We have very stringent guidelines. We review all indications of patients undergoing SRS or SRT. All cases undergoing SRS or SRT are discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting consisting of neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists. Okay. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Hari. That was, uh, thanks for sharing your wonderful work at UMMC. And also, uh, that was good learning for all the audience and also, like, you know, from both sides. Next, I would like to invite, maybe we can take questions later, Prof. Prof. Hari, but we would like to invite our next speaker, experts, uh, Prof. Adlinda from uh, Oncology Unit. And also, Prof. is actually uh, interested in the lung, breast, and many other. Uh, uh, oncology related radio surgery and radiotherapy. Today, Prof going to talk about like you know on 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 the topic given here, and also she's uh, to really highlight a, a biography. She's uh, one of the many excellent uh, clinical researchers who's also like you know involved in many clinical trials. So with that, Prof Alinda. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, good morning to Prof Pang Si Tong. Prof. Wang Chunche, Prof. Chen Kan Seng, and to all audience. Okay. So this is uh, what I was asked to share today, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery and radiotherapy in brain metastasis, UMMC experience so far. So in my talk, I will give a, a brief introduction on brain metastasis and to our service and our um, SRS protocol and uh, followed by local experience and outcomes so far. And uh, if I have time, just to touch on um, study on SRS in multiple uh, brain meds and future plan. So I actually, I really feel like a small fish <laughs> talking to your team. Um, so just a quick warm up. 
several metastases are the most common intrinsic brain um, tumors in adults. Up to 40% of cancer patients will develop brain metastases during the course of disease. And this incidence is likely to increase due to improvement with systemic therapy and patients survive longer. So median survival without treatment is estimated at one month and increased to three to 12 months when cranial radiation therapy is used. Traditionally, uh, brain metastases, especially solitary brain metastases, have been treated with surgical resection followed by whole brain radiotherapy to reduce rates of local recurrence, distant brain recurrence, and neurological death. But whole brain radiotherapy is associated with potentially greater short and long-term side effects, hence only used nowadays where SRS and SRT treatments are not feasible. For example, if there is high intracranial burden, leptomeningeal disease or financial restriction. Okay, so I will start with our humble uh, publication on radiotherapy for brain meds in non-small cell lung cancer, which we published uh, some time ago. So this is a retrospective study involving 125 patients, nothing to shout about. It was done between January 2006 and June 2012. What I want to highlight in this study, the median overall survival was three to four months for the overall group. For the whole brain uh, radiotherapy uh, involving one to three metastases, the median overall survival was 3.6 months. And for patients who had surgery or uh, SRS or SRT, the median overall survival was 8.9 months. The prognostic factors is something that um, is not surprising. Uh, ECOG performance status is important. Uh, treatment modality, whether it's whole brain therapy or local therapy. And very important, the use of post-therapy systemic treatment, which is one of the factors that we evaluate when we um, plan for treatment for whole brain, uh, for sorry, radiation uh, or surgery for uh, patient with brain metastasis. One finding that is uh, a surprise, uh, presence of seizure, which we know for um, brain tumor uh, for glioma, it is a uh, good prognostic factors, but this is what we found. And because it's this, this is a retrospective study, so this is not something that we can conclude. So when uh, we talk about treatment for brain metastasis, the goals of treatment, um, so patients with good performance status, we want to achieve durable control of CNS disease. We want to minimize early and late adverse effects of therapy and uh, because it's not a curative uh, treatment, most of the time, we want to maintain good quality of life. The selection of initial therapy depends on the number and size of brain metastasis, but also uh, there are also other factors to consider. So the degree of mass effect and edema of the brain metastasis, the presence of absence of symptoms, functional status of patient, extent on control of systemic disease or potential control. This is very important because at the time when patients present with brain mass, they might be progressing in systemic disease. So we want to see what are other systemic treatment that is available for the patient, not just a patient who is currently controlled in terms of their systemic disease. And also uh, very important patient's preference. So just to introduce uh, the background of SRS SRT service for brain meds in UMMC, we uh, received the machine, uh, Novalis machine in 2014 and uh, commissioned it and started using it towards the end of 2014. So we started with palliative cases and also uh, simple uh, radical cases. Okay. So the first SRS cases that we treated was in May 2015. We did it in conjunction with SRS workshop, which we invited Dr. Worm from Germany and a brain lab physicist. So this is a, a photo of the team at 11 o'clock at night when we treated um, quite complex multiple brain mats. Um, um, so, so far from 2015 up to now, we have treated 204. Uh, so in UM uh, setting, we have UMC Malaya Medical Center and also UMC Malaya Special Center, which is our private wing. So we've treated a total of 369 uh, number of tumors uh, with SRS and 67 uh, with SRT and total number of patients was 130. So we actually received referral internally and also from uh, other centers. So this is our SRS protocol, which I think we probably need to update soon. 
So this is from uh, 2015, 16, and we based on sort of international uh, guidelines at the time. So patient with single brain mass, we need to evaluate whether there's mass effect or no mass effect. And if there is mass effect, if it's resectable or not. And once resected, we will consider whether the patient would have stereotactic radiosurgery or radiotherapy or whole brain radiotherapy. Um, and if patient is uh, inoperable, then we will see whether um, steroid uh, helps if there is edema and subsequently plan for um, radiotherapy, either SRS or whole brain radiotherapy. So at tumor recurrence, again, we will go through the same uh, sort of uh, flow. And then when patient has limited uh, brain metastasis, and this is evaluated on MRI, uh, we know that there are uh, randomized trials which establish SRS as the standard care, replacing whole brain radiotherapy due to better preservation of patient's cognitive function without comp compromising overall survival. These are the two studies I've given reference. And again, the same concept, we need to evaluate uh, the ECO performance status and uh, possible disease, uh, systemic disease control. And we will consider SRS alone or SRS. Uh, we hardly give whole brain therapy with SRS nowadays. Um, but if it's too big, we might give whole brain therapy and consider SRS boost, SRS boost later. And in this patient also, we will evaluate whether there is a need for surgery, especially if one of the tumours is um, causing edema, and we can also do a, a surgery followed by SRS to other lesions. Okay, so um, again, um, this is for multiple brain meds. Uh, we know from um, publication by Yamamoto and colleagues in Lancet Oncology, uh, when SRS is given, uh, regardless of the number of tumour, up to 10, actually uh, overall survival did not differ. And the uh, side effects between the uh, you know limited number 2 to 4 or 5 to 10 also did not differ. So we can extend in terms of uh, the total number of meds uh, to be considered for SRS. So this is our workflow for workflow for SS. Uh, what is important to emphasize is we discuss uh, all cases in MDT, which consists of neuroradiologists, histopathologists, neurosurgeons, and clinical oncologists, plus other primary team. And for this patient, we need to uh, evaluate the MRI at least two millimeter slices, and if they are uh, dim and um, found to be and consent for the treatment uh, in terms of for the planning, we do MRI scan with T1 plus contrast and PRH plus contrast and T2 with one millimeter slices. And then we do the planning and uh, treatment it is uh, frameless using SRS mask. Okay, we aim to treat within one to two weeks. Uh, we use exact track for verification and our threshold is 0 0.5 uh, millimeter and 0 0.5 degree. So this is again going through the um, uh, management of brain mass um, in our sort of protocol. We actually treat up to 4 cm with SRS. Uh, more than 4 cm, we will consider SRT. Um, and um, there are um, the reason why I showed this is uh, when we look at our own data, actually there is a variable in terms of patient treatment itself. Um, when we treat, we actually give a uh, one to two millimeter GTV. If we do not give it um, ourselves when we uh, draw the target volume, the physicists will consider at least one millimeter uh, margin when they plan the treatment. So we prescribe. Um, this is uh, actually adapted from our talk uh, nine zero zero five protocol. So we use uh, for um, lesion less than two centimeter, twenty to twenty four gray between 21 to 3 cm 18 gray and between 3 to 4 uh, cm 15 gray. And the SRT dose we initially used was 28 gray in 7 fraction to 80% covering isodose. But nowadays we using 25 to 30 gray in 5 fraction. So we ensure 80% covers 100% of target volume. So this is our uh, data, uh, which uh, one of my medical officers have collected. So again, it is retrospective study. It is very small study. It is not like a PhD level, you know, um, study. 
Um, so this is done between May 2015 until uh, December 2017. So it's 30 month duration. So actually, uh, we collected different sort of data in terms of characteristics, but because the number is small, um, we cannot look too much into every uh, characteristics, but we do find some which is uh, statistically significant. So for in terms of median overall survival for all patients, it is 14.5 months. If we look at different treatment group, uh, we have different sort of uh, survival numerically. But uh, because it's a, uh, it's a small number of patients, uh, it is not statistically significant. So patient in the treatment uh, group of surgery, the median survival was 18 months. Surgery plus SRS, SRT is 14 months. SRT uh, or SRS alone is 13.8 months. Just to bear in mind, um, um, as I said just now, there's a variable treatment approach because we just started the service. And when I say surgery plus SRS, SRT, it doesn't necessarily mean surgery plus SRS, SRT to the cavity. It can also be surgery to one lesion and SRS, SRT to other uh, smaller lesions. So it's a combination of treatment. So um, I think RPA classification is outdated now. Uh, uh, I think GPA uh, specific for uh, different tumors is better to be looked at. But we do find that um, in this study, uh, RPA classification 2 gives the uh, best median survival. But as I say, uh, we have to take this with a pinch of salt because of the small number of patients. Um, so I just skip to the next one. Um, what we find statistically uh, significant are these three factors, which is not surprising. I mean, you can find in the literature, a for performance status is uh, very important in terms of choosing the patient because you can see the median overall survival differs when they have good or bad a performance status. In terms of primary tumor, we know uh, breast and lung gives us the best uh, outcome compared to, for example, colorectal cancer. And this, is, this goes along with, um, I guess, um, the advancement in the systemic uh, disease um, control, I mean, uh, control uh, with the advancement of treatment um, in breast and lung cancer. And the other thing we, uh, it was interesting, we looked at a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, and we find that that is significant as well. Uh, again, as I said, because it is a small study, it's not something that we can make conclusion about. Um, just interesting to look at this, patient who had surgery in terms of timeline event, actually the treatment is delivered fairly quick, quickly compared to a uh, patient who had uh, SRS, SRT only. So from diagnosis of brain mass to treatment, it takes around 20, 33, 32 uh, gosh, months compared to uh, um, surgery. Okay, um, in this study, we also looked at tumor recurrence. Uh, again, um, tumor recurrence will be a smaller number of patients. Uh, we cannot look into this too, uh, too much, but median time from treatment to recurrence is seven months. Median overall survival after recurrence is 5.6 months. And patients who had salvage therapy had longer median overall survival compared, compared to those who did not possibly because perhaps their ECOP performance status is better anyway. And uh, this gives 7.4 versus 3.42 months. So there are lots of limitations and challenges. Uh, from this study, we had low number of patients uh, over 30 month period, low uptake of surveillance MRI post treatment. So we cannot assess local control radiologically. And some patients lost to our follow-up because they are referred from other centers and it can be from another state. So they don't uh, really come back to us. And then cost of treatment to some patients. Uh, so many who would like to have SRS, SRT um, would just have received whole brain therapy because of the cost. I just touched uh, the recent uh, study um, presented at um, ASTRO. So we know Ramamoto uh, published uh, up to 10 METs. So this one looks at beyond 10 met metastases. And in actual fact, I think you probably have experience as well, or you've treated patients with multiple METs. I definitely treated several patients who had more than 10 and even up to uh, 30 metastases. For example, in a young lady with brain, um, with breast cancer, 
and has had previous uh, whole brain radiotherapy. So if you want to re re irradiate with whole brain, the number of, um, I mean, the dose that we can give is very small. So we decided to give SRS and patient actually was still alive six months later. So in this study, they look at memory function at four months. And as you can see from uh, this plot, obviously SRS uh, gives better uh, memory function at four months compared to SRS, uh, sorry, compared to whole brain radiotherapy. Um, as we expected, no, no difference in terms of overall survival. Um, local control is better with SRS. Distant control is better with whole brain. It's no surprising, although it's not statistically uh, significant. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, time to systemic therapy. This is very important. As I said just now, sometimes patients who progress in brain also progress systemically. So we don't want to delay time to systemic therapy. And this shows that with SRS, we can shorten the time to systemic therapy. In terms of uh, toxicity, less toxicity with SRS. So again, no, over, uh, no difference in overall survival, but in terms of neurocognitive uh, deterioration, it's worse with whole brain radiotherapy and shorter treatment time to systemic therapy. So our future plan is to update our own uh, you know, date, audit data and our SRS protocol. Um, we want to look at uh, V12 brain dose and adverse effects, mainly cognitive function, memory and quality of life. We hope that we can collaborate with other centers, that's a hint, <laughs> to increase the number. And I'm sure we can learn a lot from, from your team. With that, I thank you. Right, Prof Linda, thank you so much for sharing the, the finding from your study. Though you mentioned it's a small number of patients involved in it, I think it's very useful for the as a guidance for your next study as well. So we'd like to uh, open the floor for the question and answer sections. And if I can invite from Changgung's side, any questions for our panel, uh, our experts today? Yeah, uh, actually, we use a uh, uh, normal system uh, since uh, year 2006. And uh, till now, because we start the radio surgery um, like, uh, almost like, uh, uh, 20 years ago, at first uh, we use a brain lab con based system. And uh, till now, we have like, more than uh, 3,000 patients with the radio surgery. And uh, for the uh, acoustic nova, and uh, actually, I am interested in what the uh, criteria or what kind of situation you will choose for the SRT and the, what kind of tumor we use uh, the radio surgery, the single pressure? For the... Hello, hi, thank you, thank you very much. So when dealing, when making the decision whether to go for a single fraction stereotactic radio surgery or uh, to hyperfraction it or go for multiple fraction for vestibular schwannoma. So the three things we take into account is one, the tumor size and its relations to the eloquent structures. So generally it's whether there's any significant brainstem or pontine compression. So it's a very good question, Prof, because, you know, when people go by the rule, 3 cm or less, we go for SRS. More than 3 cm, we go for SRT. No. I have treated with Professor Linda tumors as small as 2.6 centimeters with SRT, fractionated it because there was significant compression on the brainstem. Okay. And conversely, we have actually gone up as high as uh, 3.8 cm or more with SRS because we had a nice CSF cleft between the pons and the tumor. And so we were able to give a good a marginal dose and secure control. The other thing that we are increasingly starting to do now for fractionation is because of hearing preservation. So what happens is when they have got good hearing scores, GR1 or two, we will, and even though the treatment plant is amenable to SRS, we will actually opt for fractionation to keep the dose on the cochlea low so we do not risk hearing loss. So these are some of the uh, things we look at when we are deciding between single fraction or hyperfractionation.
Yeah, we, we almost follow the same rule as uh, Dr. Harvey. Yeah. Yeah. And, Thanks. Uh, but uh, for the uh, SRT, actually we use uh, like a protocol, like a uh, seven grade uh, with uh, the three fractions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, okay. Even the dose is kind of, uh, I think it's relatively safe to the like brain step. Yeah. And uh, yes. so, yeah. Well, I think we are for the like acoustic neuroma, and I think the radio surgery is a very, very good uh, treatment modality. Yeah. And uh, we almost can don't see any patient with uh, like a facial palsy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I also have a question uh, regarding the acoustic neuroma. Uh, but the hurry, uh, sometimes when we encounter a very small tumor, um, yeah. maybe less than one centimeter uh, uh, reside in inside the IAC. Yes. It means that they have a very good hearing at that time before treatment. Yes. And so it's easier to, to use the uh, uh, raw dose to in this kind of patient with good functioning of the hearing. Use what? Sorry, I lost you there, bro. Low dose in, in this patient with good function. Oh, low dose, low dose. Yeah, yeah. Low dose and I see. So our intracanalicular tumors. Okay, so our our management protocol is if they are intracanalicular of a small size and they are asymptomatic with good hearing preservation with, with, with normal hearing, then that is one of the few cases where we are inclined to manage them expectantly. Meaning, we wait and watch, do surveillance MRIs, or look for progression of symptoms. But if they are symptomatic in our center, generally but not invariably, if they are symptomatic, meaning if there's tinnitus or uh, disequilibrium, then we treat. So when hearing is intact, completely intact, what we do is, um, I know your question is whether we go on a low dose, but uh, whether we lower the dose. But what we do is rather still maintain the prescription between 11 to 12 grays, okay, and minimize the dose fall off to the cochlea. So, not really compromised on the dosimetry per se. Okay, thank you. And the other question is regarding the the and two patients with bilateral uh, acoustic neuroma, bilateral one. Uh, will you treat both of the the left side and, and right side tumor at the same time, or you will choose the the only one of them with uh, symptoms? What's yeah. your opinion? So and and have to consider this to be uh, continues to be a challenge for us. Good question, Prof. So. No, I do not treat both at the same time. All right. So what we do is we appraise the patient as a whole, looking at the size of the tumors, the hearing on both sides, and we treat one at a time. One. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Prof Fang. I, uh, sorry, uh, Prof Singh. Um, I think we may have a one quick question from the audience. Someone raised just now, Mira. Is there any question from audience? I saw someone raised the hand. If not, I think uh, at this point, I also would like to invite Prof. Vairavan, our another neurosurgeon, to give a remarks. Uh, how you see any potential interest collaboration? Um, so, uh, Professor Pang Si Tong, Wang Chun Che, Chen Kang Seng, I think uh, we had a very uh, interesting talk earlier. Thank you very much uh, for sharing with us your vast experience. There is uh, so much we can learn. We are still a in this field, we are still a relatively young unit, and uh, this is one of the benefits of uh, this collaboration we have, uh, University of Malaya has uh, initiated with uh, Changgung. So we hope to learn and to collaborate with you. 
and I think uh, Professor Adlinda as well as Professor Hari are uh, quite keen uh, to collaborate on both the clinical uh, pathways as well as research pathways. So we're talking about clinical pathways in terms of uh, especially with your proton beam, which is uh, uh, one of these uh, machines which are very uniquely useful and we do have patients who will benefit from them. So we would like to explore clinical referral mechanisms for our patients. Uh, similarly, we also would like to uh, look at uh, uh, research collaborations, uh, which uh, I think uh, we have got a unique set of patients, a multicultural, multiracial, uh, diverse genetic pool of patients who we can uh, contribute to uh, a research, uh, uh, a unique uh, research perspective. And so I think uh, uh, we hope we can continue with our collaborations and uh, we probably uh, will uh, reach out to you uh, via email, I think, uh, Prof. Linda and Prof. Hari, and we can see how we can take this further. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly, and looking forward to that, Prof. Thank you. All right, that's really uh, nice to hear from both team. Prof. Pang? Yes. No, sorry, I uh, interrupt. Uh, I think we share the same vision and, and, and hopefully uh, it's really just a starting point from now and, and we can continue collaboration and, and work together and to solve patient problems together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this point also probably I can uh, give a little bit of extra information about between Malaysia and Taiwan, uh, we do have signed agreement like you know how the, the clinical trial that the protocol that established in Taiwan can be translated in Malaysia without much of the hiccups. So that is one platform I would say is more facilitating how that like you know things done there in terms of research clinical trial can be translated here. So that is one good point. And with that, I would like to thank on behalf of International Office, I would like to thank all the experts, especially the moderator from uh, Chengeng side, Prof Fang and Prof Wang. And uh, Prof Seng, thank you so much for sharing your, your findings. And also from our side, Prof Hari and Prof Adina, thanks so much for joining us today. So with that, I would like to conclude today's sections and I wish everyone a nice day and also a nice week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.